Hi friends, welcome to EPG Partshala. I'm Dr. Ritu Khosla, Assistant Professor in the Department of Political Science, MCM DIV College for Women, Chandigarh. Today, we will, I will be teaching you the paper Western Political Thought and the module that we will be studying is Karl Marx and Scientific Socialism. Now, Karl Marx is considered as one of the most prominent and most revolutionary writer, scholar, as well as the revolutionary person. He was the one who was the originator of the scientific socialism and through his ideas and through his innovative concepts, he was able to give a new viewpoint to the whole world that was also accepted and rejected by many. His whole philosophy can be based on the three elements. The first one is the philosophy itself, second the political theory and then the economic theory. Now Karl Marx, he was born in 1818 in Rhineland in, the, in, in Prussia. Now, when he was a very young, young student, he came under the influence of the young Hegelians, a group that he joined also. And from the very beginning, he was very radical in nature. And because of his radical viewpoints, he was not even given the, uh, the university employment as a teacher. And then he changed his career, he became a radical journalist. And because again of his radical views, he was expelled from Prussia. The most important phase of and the, we can say the most intellectual phase of Marx's life came when he came in association with angels and along with angels he developed his concept of scientific socialism and later on also both in 1848 they developed and they wrote the communist manifesto that became as a bible for the communists to follow over the period of time. The objectives of the study is to critically understand scientific socialism as propounded by Karl Marx. Now talking about the source of Marx thought, Marx was greatly influenced by the philosophy of Hegel as a student of Bonn and Berlin University. From Hegel, he learned the fact that the world, including individuals and societies, is dynamic in nature and is in a constant flux. Its history involves not only sequence of events, but also a gradual course of unfoldment that proceeds in a dialectical way. All development occurs through contrast and conflict. Hegel's dialectical formula thus involves thesis, antithesis and synthesis. Second, Marx was also under the influence of classical school of British political economy, especially Adam Smith, Ricardo and William Thompson for the theory of value and surplus value. Third, from French Revolution tradition, he built up his theory of state and revolution. Now, further talking about the character of the Marxian socialism. Marxian socialism is popularly known as scientific socialism or proletarian socialism. Marx called his theory scientific as it is based on the study of past history, which is a necessary product of historical development. Also, instead of attacking the evil outcomes of capitalism, it assails the capitalist system itself. Now, we will talk talk about the dialectical materialism theory propounded by Karl Marx. The entire structure of Marxism rests on the doctrine of dialectical materialism. The idea of dialectic process can be traced back to the ancient Greeks. Later, it was George Hegel who first made the application of dialectic to historical progress. Marx, though influenced by Hegel, did not adopt complete version of Hegel's dialectic rather changed it to suit his own views on historical progress. Marx used dialectic as a means to explain historical development, but in the preface to the second edition of Das Kapital, he wrote, in Hegel's writing, dialectic stands on its head. You must turn it right away up again if you want to discover the rational kernel that is hidden away within the wrappings of mystification. While Hegel regarded spirit as the evolving reality, but for Marx it was matter. Hegel considered history as the evolution and unfoldment of the world spirit. On the other hand, for Marx it was economic forces. Marx considered history as evolution of matter and not of idea. Now further talking about Marx's dialectical materialism, Marx considered the world by its very nature materialistic, which constitutes different forms of matter in motion. The world develops as per the laws of movement in matter. In other words, Marx assumes nature or material world as primary and mind or thought as secondary. Thus, the material interests of society are of primary importance and spiritual life of secondary importance. Marx thus considered the spiritual life as a mere manifestation of this objective reality. In the words of Marx, it is not the consciousness of men that determines their being, but on contrary, 
their social being that determines their consciousness. The various social doctrines that developed at various time frames of history were thus merely expression of the material being of society. Marx's conviction in dialectic process made him believe that socialism can never be born except out of the ashes of the capitalist society. He advocated that capitalism bears in itself the seeds of its own destruction and out of this conflict between capitalist class and the working class, the classless society will emerge. Thus, by using this dialectic method, Marx called his concept scientific. Marx considered dialectic as a force behind every supposed absolute truth. On the basis of materialism, he gave a sweeping rejection of religion, which he regarded as the opium of people. Marx believed that religion provided merely imagination satisfactions to the people that in turn misdirected their rational efforts to found real satisfactions. Another implication of dialectical materialism was that it suggested a kind of social revolution that would pave a way for the establishment of a new superior society in which the state would no longer be required. Through this social revolution, production would be socialized, which would further result in the elimination of all sources of exploitation and social inequality. The final goal of social development would thus be classless society. Now, after discussing the dialectical materialism, one observes that though it is strange that the theory of dialectical materialism occupies the fundamental place in socialist structure, but Marx and Engels never worked out to develop their ideas about it. Nowhere do they write on it in detail, despite the fact that it is assumed in all their writings. The theory of materialistic interpretation of history is based on the simple truth that man must live to eat and his endurance depends upon the success with which he can produce to fulfill his requirements. Society, though created to fulfill the necessities of life, has never succeeded in its aim, thus resulting in tensions and stresses. The doctrine of historical materialism can be stated as not only the economic structure of society, rather man's entire political, intellectual and spiritual activities are the inevitable consequence of economic factors. It implies that economic factor is the sole factor that determines history, intellectual and spiritual activity, laws and institution. As Marx said, the political and intellectual life of a society is determined by the mode of production as necessitated by the wants of material life. With the innovation of new productive forces, the then existing economic structure becomes inadequate and inappropriate, thus demanding a change. This change is then resisted by prevailing vested interest, thus resulting in a revolution. Marx thus observes that all revolutions are resultant of economic factors. Marx further draws a distinction between forces of production and the relations of production. The forces of production comprise the existing natural resources, the tools and machinery inherited from past and the capabilities of the people to utilize these resources and make technological advances. To make efficient use of the available forces of production, Appropriate and necessary economic, social, religious and philosophical institutions are set up by men. Marx considered forces of production dynamic, which are subject to constant change that may happen due to discovery of new raw material, new source of power or due to enhancement in techniques of production. Such changes demand corresponding change in the relations of production so that the available forces of production could be fully utilized. Marx firmly believed that failure in the relations of production like social, legal and political institutions in adjusting themselves with the rapid changing system of production and distribution of wealth leads to crisis in society. The single way out to bring out society out of this crisis is revolution. Now, though Marx's doctrine of materialistic interpretation of history is not infalliable, as it has many shortcomings that make the doctrine illogical, the doctrine of materialistic interpretation of history overlooks the role played by non-economic factors in determining history. It has overlooked the fact that human passions, sentiments, emotions, religion, personality, etc. influences human activities. 
historical materialism further fails to verify how small incidents fabricate mighty results no single factor can become a big movement further if relations of production are based on forces of production then it becomes hard to explain why a like force of production generate different relations of production and also different political and legal systems in the present day states great power resides in the hands of high administrative officials the military corps in various states also give lie to the marxian theory also the marxian economic explanation of war is neither wholly true nor wholly false and can account only part of the historical reality for example the core of the conflict in the two world wars was not the protection of british investments in africa or of american loans to british and france but the more fundamental issue of whether totalitarian militarism was to rule the world further discuss the theory of class war or class struggle as given by marx According to Marx the history of all hitherto existing society is the history of class struggles Marx articulates that all times and in every country society tends to divide itself into two hostile classes on the basis of their economic conditions one is the small privileged class that owns means of production and the other is a large class of workers who convert the raw material into usable commodities in the ancient rome there were partisans knights plebeians and slaves In the Middle Ages, feudal lords, vassals, guild masters, journeymen, serfs. Similarly, class antagonism prevails in modern society too. The difference between the time eras is that the new classes, new methods, new forms of oppression and new forms of struggle have replaced the old ones. In current scenario, society has split up into two hostile camps: bourgeoisie and proletariat. Marx however has not worked in detail on the class struggle in the ancient and medieval periods as he was more interested in examination of the clash between the exploiting capitalist and the exploited proletariat class The fundamental argument of Marxian philosophy is that every system of production society is inclined to divide up into two hostile camps with contradictory interests on the basis by which men can earn livelihood society can be divided into two broad classes the capitalist and the wage earning a capitalist is one who owns the material means of production that is land workshop raw material and capital the wage earner is one who survives by selling his labor he either tills the land of landlord or works in a workshop where he converts the raw material provided to him by the capitalist into a usable product Marx however argues that howsoever necessary one class may be to the other the interests of two would collide one can expand only at the cost of other capitalist owners want to earn more and more profits and want the factory workers to work for them at subsistence wages whereas the wage earners want to gain highest possible price for their labor but in this competition the wage earners are positioned at the disadvantageous place and this provides capitalist an opportunity to oppress and exploit them marx also points out that the modern bourgeoisie is itself the creation of series of revolutions in the modes of production and exchange the weapons which the bourgeoisie brought feudalism to ground are ironically now turned against the bourgeoisie itself This new weapon would now be wielded by the modern working class that is the proletarians therefore what the bourgeoisie are producing would lead to their own grave digging thus the fall of capitalist at the victory of the proletariat is inevitable the theory of value and surplus value karl marx was not an expert economist and thus depended on his friend engels for economic ideas also his theory of value is majorly influenced by ricardian theory in fact marx was once called a ricardo turned socialist as he shared many of his ideas and assumptions with him but yet directed them to different conclusions Marxian theory of value unlike other theories of value is not a theory of prices as it does not try to explain the notion of prices and the reasons behind their fluctuations rather it is a theory that explains the exploitation of labor by the bourgeoisie under capitalist system of production 
Marx considered labor as the sole creator of value. Out of the four elements of production, namely labor, land, capital and organization, the latter three elements are unproductive as they can reproduce only when labor is put in them and are thus of no source of value. Among all four elements, it is only the labor which is a variable element and thus adds value. As per the theory of surplus value, the value generated by the workers above their subsistence level is called surplus value. The capitalist buys the labor of a poor worker, employs that to the resources that he possesses and thus generates a commodity having exchange value. Such a commodity is sold for a price much greater than the wages paid to the workers and the amount required for the upkeep of the factory. This difference between the exchange value of the manufactured commodity and the price paid to the workman for his labor is the surplus value. This value though is generated by the labor of a worker but is kept by the capitalist who employs him. Marx calls it as a product of unpaid labor. For example, let us assume that it takes 8 hours of work for a laborer to produce necessities of life for his and his family's survival. If a laborer is made by the capitalist to work for 14 hours but it is remunerated only subsistence wage, then the extra 6 hours of labor is of surplus value. Marx argues that the surplus value can only be produced by labor, so the labor should have a claim over it. Also, any profit that capitalists make through workers' labor is exploitative. Marx opines that the surplus value can only be eliminated with the defeat of capitalism and socialization of means of production followed by the end of exploitation of laborers. Now the further concept of Marx that we are going to study is theory of state and revolution. Now Marx never made any attempt to devise a comprehensive and systematic theory of state. The Marxian theory of state finds its full expression in a book called The Origins of the Family, Private Property and the State which was written by angels. The Marxian theory of state is seen as a structured power of one class for subjugating the other. The state is seen as nothing more than an organization which the bourgeoisie adopted for the mutual guarantee of their property and interests. Thus being the expression of the dominance and a part of machinery of the class struggle, the essence of state power lies in its pure repressive character. According to Marx and Engels, the state does not and cannot really stand above the conflict of classes. It only appears to do so. It does not really hold the conflicting economic classes in check. It only appears to do so. Further, Marx did not consider state as a high moral institution. He had no faith in the Hegelian idea that the state is a march of God on earth. Rather, Marx held that the state is merely a servant to the property class. The essence of the modern democratic state lies in the fact that it is based on unhampered growth of bourgeoisie society, on the free movement of private interest. The state aims to maintain the socio-economic and political order of the ruling class. As pointed out in the Communist Manifesto, the government in modern state is a committee that manages the common affairs the whole bourgeoisie. After winning this machinery of the state, the ruling class of all time made use of its legal authority to oppose all major changes. Major changes, according to Marx, could be brought only through the revolution, and the working classes were to organize themselves for that purpose. The Marxist theory of revolution is an integral part of his doctrine of dialectical materialism. As per the dialectic model, development of thesis and antithesis takes place gradually. But as a consequence of the conflict between the two, synthesis appear in a sudden stroke. Similarly, productive forces innate in any society build up completely before a change takes place and a change itself would be a sudden. This sudden revolutionary change will eventually transform the complete structure of society until the new society in its turn is overthrown and remolded. Thus, any considerable social change is the result of revolution. Marx considered revolution as indispensable midwife of social change. In the Communist Manifesto, Marx proclaimed the democratic aim of a proletariat revolution. As per manifesto, the first step in the working class revolution is the raising of the proletariat to the position of the ruling class.
the victory of democracy. The proletariat movement is the conscious movement of the intense majority in the interest of the intense majority. Marx talked about the development of revolution in two phases. In the first phase, the bourgeoisie would undertake a struggle with feudalists. In this struggle, the proletariat would lend their support to the bourgeoisie and later search for an opportunity to seize power from bourgeoisie. In the second phase of the revolution, the bourgeoisie that initially crushed feudalism would be destroyed by the proletariat with the help of left-wing bourgeoisie components and these bourgeoisie elements would be later on rejected by the proletariat. After the throw away of the bourgeoisie state, the proletariat would still need the state. It will be a transitional revolutionary state in which state will be dominated by the proletariat. The proletariat would strive to bring all means of production, industries, land, business, communications, transportation and commerce under the influence of state. The proletariat state would have a system of heavy and progressive income tax with elimination of child labor in factories and provision of free education for all children in public schools. Marx believed that dictatorship of proletariat will be more democratic and liberal than the bourgeoisie democracy. The proletariat would further crush the opposing forces leading to the establishment of the communist society. Both Marx and Engels believed that following the proletariat rule, the state will wither away automatically with the extinction of all classes. The abolition of classes implies the abolition of the state and in a society where there is no classes, there can be no state. In the then formed society, everyone will work. However, the initial division of labor will disappear. The newly formed society will become a means of emancipation of men by giving each individual the opportunity to develop and exercise all his faculties, physical and mental, in all directions, in which, therefore, productive force will become a pleasure instead of a burden. The new society will be based on principle, from each according to his capacity to each according to his need. Okay, friends, let me conclude now what we have studied till now. Now, if you talk about the whole philosophy of Karl Marx that revolves around protecting the interest of the proletariat class, his theory is more scientific in nature. The reason being, he tried to lay down the roots of his theory in the past. For instance, he talked about that if we talk about class struggle from the very beginning till since the time that there was the conception of the concept of private property, since that time, the classes or the society have been divided in two classes. The one is the haves, the second one is the have-nots. Haves are those who are having the control over the means of production and have-nots who have nothing else except for their labor to sell. That is why they are being exploited by the haves. And even at the current time, the Karl Marx he was the opinion that the classes are the bourgeoisies, those are the rich people and the second one is the proletariat that is a working class. And this working class of proletariat is being exploited by the bourgeoisies. However, in all these things, the Karl Marx, he ignored one important aspect that we don't have only two classes, other classes are also there. For example, you have the middle class, which is further subdivided into the lower middle class, the upper middle class. And this forms a very big part of the population. But however, this altogether was ignored by Karl Marx. Furthermore, when he talked about the dictatorship of the proletariat, at the current time, we talked about the protecting the rights of the people, the liberties of the people. So the dictatorship or the authoritarian rule has no place in such a system. Moreover, he said that if we talk about the proletariat revolution, that is based on force, that is based on violence, and that cannot be justified under any circumstances. Thank you.